In his commentary on the Psalms, Bible teacher Steve Lawson quotes former President Woodrow Wilson in a profoundly wise statement that the president made concerning failure and success. President Wilson said this, he said, I had rather temporarily fail in a cause that will ultimately succeed than temporarily succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. Now, without realizing it, these words by Woodrow Wilson actually spell out the gist of David's message in Psalm 37. I'd like you to open to Psalm 37. We've been going through this, as you know, and we have noted for the past few weeks while studying this psalm that the problem that David was addressing in his day, in this psalm, is that the believers of his day were quite upset because of the material success and the wealth of many wicked people in Israel. They didn't think it was supposed to be that way. They were upset because evildoers, as verse 1 tells us, were prospering. And the word that David so often uses in this, in this psalm to describe the attitude of these believers is that they were fretting, which as we've already seen, it means that they were angry, they were irritated, they were upset over the, over the prosperity of those that they referred to, and David refers to them as evildoers and wicked, wicked people. And at the same time, they were envious of these people. They wanted what they had. It was aggravated by the fact that they were going through difficult times financially. And so they looked at the, the prosperity of the wicked and they wondered what was going on and they, and they were envious and jealous. And in addition to being angry and jealous, they were also worried for their very lives because these evildoers were presently persecuting them, threatening to murder them. Verse 12 tells us this, the wicked plots against the righteous, gnashes at him with his teeth. And we, we studied more about this last week. They were trying to, to kill them. It was persecution. So understanding that this was the, the problem facing the believers in Israel, David as their king and leader and shepherd sets out in Psalm 37 to help these people see the bigger picture about these evildoers. And the bigger picture is that their initial success isn't the whole story, nor is it the final chapter of the story. It's just something taking place at that moment, but he tells them it won't always be this way. The situation will change in the future. See, David wants the believers to take what one Bible teacher calls the long look. Uh, the long look is the look into the future so that they can see the complete truth about these evildoers and as I've said, the complete truth is that although the wicked may be enjoying some success right now, their cause will ultimately fail because God won't let them continue to prosper indefinitely. Now, that's the message that David has been stressing in the first two sections of Psalm 37. So from verses 1 through 20, which we've already covered, he's been teaching that the way to cease from fretting and worrying about these evildoers is by expanding our viewpoint by looking down the road, seeing that the future for these people is so bleak, it's so dismal because their success is so very brief, it's fleeting, it's momentary, it's here today and then it's gone tomorrow. He says that in verse 2, for they will wither quickly like the grass, fade like the green herb. He says in verse 20, but the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Now, in addition, David has also stressed in these verses that the way to overcome this anger and this envious, jealous, covetous spirit towards these ungodly rich people is by concentrating on our own relationship with the Lord. That is to say, forget about others. Concentrate, focus on your own personal walk with the Lord. And so at the beginning of this psalm, he's given a number of commands to us in terms of our relationship with the Lord. He's told us to trust in him, to obey him, to delight ourselves in him, to commit our way to him, to, to rest in him. Look to the Lord to be the one who satisfies you. And stop looking at other people and their circumstances. Get your eyes off of them and onto the Lord himself. And now last week in studying verses 12 through 20, we learned from David that if we take this long 
look, we'll see that no matter how hard these evildoers plan to carry out their evil schemes of persecution, in the end, God is going to frustrate their plans so that they will ultimately fail. That's why we saw from verse 12 that while the wicked may plot now against the righteous, verse 12 says God laughs at them. God laughs at them because of the sheer foolishness, uh, the absurdity of thinking that they can continue their evil forever without any consequences. In addition, David taught us that while the wicked may have already drawn their, their sword, taken it out of the sheaths, preparing to use it against some poor believer, God will eventually use their own evil devices against them. He tells us that in verses 14 and 15. For the sake of time, I'm not repeating those verses. But remember we said last week, it's like a boomerang. It's going to come back and hit them. He also taught that while the wicked may have an abundance of things right now, God will eventually cause them to lose it all. And finally, we heard David teach that while the wicked may seem to have everything going for them right now, the good life as we would call it, at some point God will intervene and he will take away their lives so that someday they will just vanish, never to be heard from again. What they have said, what they have done, what they have accomplished in this lifetime will mean nothing. So up to this point, David has taught us that the way to get over our frettings to take the long look, trust the Lord, and believe the truth that all the evil planned by evildoers will end up being futile and unsuccessful. Now this morning as we continue our study of Psalm 37, we have arrived at a new section of the psalm, the third section in which David is still telling us how to keep from fretting over, over, over evildoers, but... What he does is he shifts now his emphasis from telling us about what God is going to do to these people negatively to telling us what he is going to do for us believers positively. Now listen closely. It's important to understand that the problem with the believers in David's day wasn't simply that so many evildoers were prospering. But as I said, it was compounded by the fact that by comparison, these folks were so poor. And that seems so contradictory to the covenant that God had made with Israel that he would materially bless those who obeyed him and he would refrain from blessing those who disobeyed him. So what David does in these verses is assure these true believers a wonderful truth. The Lord has not forgotten you. The Lord has not forgotten them. That God is attentive to their needs and he'll He'll meet every one of their financial and material needs. Now, this is not the health and wealth gospel. This is not to say they'll be wealthy. This is to say that God is faithful to meet the needs of his people. That's certainly a critical truth for us to know because money, whether we like it or not, is such an important and necessary part of our lives. And we need to know that we can trust the Lord to provide for us materially just as we can trust him to deal as he said he would with unbelievers, those who may persecute us. So what we find in these verses before us is David telling us how the Lord blesses his people materially. He reveals to us three specific ways that God blesses us when it comes to material things. And we trust, and I trust, that this will be an encouragement for all of us. First way being this, that he blesses us, note this, with more than we need. He blesses us with more than we need. We break in at verse 21. David says, The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. Now, this is an interesting statement by David because the first thing he does in this verse is actually talk about the, the wicked. And he tells us that the wicked borrows and he doesn't pay it back. Now, what makes this so interesting is that David doesn't tell us why the wicked doesn't pay back the money or the material things that he's, he's borrowed? Is it because they are so evil, so greedy, so selfish that they just refuse to pay back their debts, even if they have the money? Is that what David means? In other words, do the wicked not repay because this is just part of their wicked character? They think they can get away with this. Well, it is possible that that's what David means because this certainly fits the character of those who are wicked. And there are some very competent, some very good Bible teachers who interpret David's words this way. 
However, it seems more plausible, to me at least, that what David is saying here is that the wicked borrow and don't repay because God will eventually deal with them and take away their money so that they have no money to repay. See, what David stresses throughout this psalm is not so much the character of the wicked. He mentions it, but that's not, that's not what he stresses. What he stresses in this psalm is that the prosperity of the wicked is only temporary. It's fleeting. That seems to be what he's saying here. And if that's the case, then what David is telling us about the wicked is that he borrows money and doesn't pay it back because he just can't pay it back. Because he doesn't have any money left to pay it back. In other words, God has dealt in judgment with this evil man. He has taken away his wealth so that now he is in poverty himself and he doesn't have the wherewithal to repay anything. Now, it seems to me that this is what David is saying and it just fits not only the the context of the whole psalm, the emphasis, but it seems to me that it fits the natural flow of this verse because after telling us that a wicked man doesn't repay money that he has borrowed, David immediately tells us how different the righteous are, and he means by righteous believers, true believers, those who have been converted. He tells us how different believers are when it comes to money. Notice, as he continues, he says, but the righteous (coughs) is gracious and he gives. Now, in contrast to the wicked, who won't pay back money that they've borrowed, David says that the righteous, as I said, meaning a true believer, is gracious and far from withholding money from anyone, this man gives his money to others. And the reason he gives his money away, note this, is because unlike the wicked man who has no more money to pay back, God has blessed the godly man with more money than he needs to take care of himself and his family, and so he generously thinks of others and gives to them. That's why David follows up this statement in the the very next verse about God blessing, blessing this man in relation to his land, meaning his farming land. Much of the the blessings of that God gave to the Jewish people related to the land, and, and he cuts off the wicked from the land, meaning the land of Israel. Notice verse 23, for those blessed by him will inherit the land but those cursed by him will be cut off. God has promised that these Jewish believers, though struggling to make it now, will eventually be blessed by fruitfulness, productivity in their land, while the wicked, he says, though prosperous now, will eventually be removed from the land and not enjoy any productivity, fruitfulness. Now, going back to verse 21, this statement about the righteous being gracious and giving, generous. Folks, this is a profound statement by David. It's one that I think needs to be thought through and looked at from a number of angles. And the first angle being this, that we need to consider that the primary truth that David is teaching here is that God is gracious to bless believers with enough materially so that they can give some of it away to others. This is a far cry from the believers in David's day, what they were thinking. They were envious of the wicked, envious for their wealth while they were struggling financially. See, what David is telling them is that while the wicked may be prospering right now, their prosperity will not continue forever because God is going to someday intervene. He's going to judge them by making sure that their money like them will vanish so that eventually they'll be hurting financially to the point where they won't be able to pay back their debts. And by the same token, while God is doing that to the wicked, he's going to also materially bless the righteous, who although they may be experiencing hard times right now, their hard times won't last forever, because eventually God will meet their financial needs and bless them to the point that they'll have enough to share with others. Now, it seems to me, that this is the primary point that David is making. And it is a significant point because he is telling us that God will not only meet our needs, but that he will be so gracious, so generous generous in meeting our needs that he will give us sufficient funds so that we can be gracious and generous with others to help meet their needs. So I want us to consider further this truth that God does 
meet our needs and that he meets them generously. Once again, we're not talking about luxuries, although the Lord certainly can choose to give some of us luxuries. In fact, everybody in America, compared to the rest of the world, we live with luxuries. But this is not the health and wealth gospel. This is just God telling us he's faithful to meet our needs. Perhaps the best place to look at this truth about God's generosity to believers is in the New Testament. I'd like you to look at Philippians chapter 4, because this principle is taught throughout Scripture, and it is especially taught here, surprisingly taught here, in Philippians chapter 4, and you'll see why in a moment. In Philippians chapter 4, which I have quoted for several weeks, Paul makes this astounding promise as the Holy Spirit guides him. He says, and my God, verse 19, will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, in this statement, the apostle assures these believers at the church of Philippi that God will supply all of their needs and that they don't need to worry about their needs being met. Why? Because God, he says, is infinitely wealthy and therefore he will share some of that wealth with them. He owns everything. Now, initially, this looks to be a universal promise made for all believers in Christ. But it's not. It's not. That's what may surprise you. Because if you look closely at the context, you'll, you'll realize that Paul has been commending this church, the people of this church, for being very loving, very thoughtful, very generous towards him. Notice, let's go back to verse 10. Now remember, when Paul wrote this, He's in jail. They're not sure exactly where he's in, where he's at. They found him. And now we, we look at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity, meaning you didn't know where I was. How could you help me? But they found out. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Now, let me stop here and explain. When they found out where Paul was as a prisoner in Rome, they sent someone to meet his needs, monetarily, supplies, perhaps, perhaps some, uh, some books, maybe uh, health issues. He needed perhaps some medicine, things like that. Whatever it was, that's what they did. So Paul says, not, not that I speak from want. I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I've learned this. This is not a natural thing for any of us. Paul said, I learned the lesson of contentment. He writes, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And then he says this very famous verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And let me stop here. This is not saying that if you're a mediocre athlete, you can expect to be a great athlete because Paul said you can do everything. No, this is simply Paul saying, I I've learned that in every situation, God strengthens me. When I'm poor, he strengthens me. When I have a lot, he strengthens me. When I'm going through difficult times, he strengthens me. And I can do it all. I have his grace to do Everything necessary in all circumstances. He says in verse 14, having said that he is content, he is happy, he has enough, he says, nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. It's a good thing. Even though I'm content, even though I don't need what you sent me because I've learned to be content, it's a good thing. So even though Paul says he's content with what he has, he doesn't actually need what they gave him. He's content, but they've done the right thing. Let's, let's read on. Verse 15, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, that's where the church at Philippi was. It was in a region known as Macedonia. No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. Now, can you imagine that? No church was thoughtful enough to say, you know, I, I'll bet this man has some needs. He's given us the gospel. Let's give him something. He said, only you, only you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. 
This was a church that was thoughtful and generous and sensitive to Paul. Now he says, he doesn't want to be misunderstood, verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself. He said, I'm not, I'm not ministering to get anything from you. He said, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. I seek your reward and glory for being so generous. But I have received everything, verse 18, everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, that's the man they sent him, what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice. It's well-pleasing to the Lord, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Do you see what Paul is saying? He says that the Philippians were the only church that was thoughtful and generous with him so as to supply him with money and provisions. Now, keep in mind what he's saying. He's saying to this thoughtful, generous, sensitive, gracious church that those who were so generous to supply his needs can count on God being generous to them to supply all of their needs. That is to say, God's promise of generosity is not a blanket promise that covers every Christian, but it's a promise only for those Christians who are generous with others. Now, God will meet our needs, but generosity of God is dependent on us being generous with others. Now, David says in, verse, in Psalm 37 that the righteous will be blessed by God that they will have enough to give to others. The implication is that they are generous themselves, that they are giving. As I said before, it doesn't mean that all believers will be wealthy by the world's standards, but it certainly means that we will have sufficient funds to be generous in sharing those funds with others. However, while we wish we could say that every Christian is generous with their money, we all know that that's not the case. There are far too many Christians who are not generous with others, they think only of themselves, they are greedy, they may call it being frugal, but they are greedy and penny-pinching to the point that they don't ever think about being generous with others, and whether they realize it or not, stinginess is a horrible testimony for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who has been so generous with us, who is so gracious in giving salvation to us and all the blessings that come with it. For example... Do you realize the terrible reputation that the Sunday church crowd has amongst waiters and waitresses in restaurants? I've heard this from waiters and waitresses, some saved and some unsaved. Church people, on Sundays especially, are known to be very demanding to their servers while being very poor tippers, if they tip at all. These servers see you praying, your heads are bowed, they assume you're praying, they hear you talk about church that you've just come out of, and they assume that you're a Christian, and then to get a very poor tip from you, or worse, a poor tip with the gospel tract, is a great turnoff to the gospel. What kind of a server would be interested in learning about your Savior, if that's how you represent him? Listen, for a few dollars, just a few bucks... Even if you have to over-tip and go beyond the customary percentage guidelines for tipping, think of the impact a large tip might make for Christ. Is it not worth it? Now, one of the excuses that Christians often give for not being generous is that, well, you have to be wealthy to be generous. That generosity is only for those who make so much money that they can easily afford to give some of it away. That's not true. That's not true. And that's not what David is saying in Psalm 37. He's not teaching, as I said, the health and wealth gospel, as if God's will is that we all be in good health and we all be very wealthy. He's simply saying that God blesses us with enough so that we can share some of what we have with others who have legitimate needs. I'm not talking about being foolish and giving to people who are going to run out and, and do horrible things with the money. Legitimate needs. In fact, many believers... In fact, if you go around the world, most believers are on the poor side. <clears throat> but according to the word of God, they still have enough to share with others. How do I know that? Well, the best example of this is the Philippians themselves. These people who were so very generous with, with Paul, because not only were they poor, they were dirt poor. Dirt poor. 
yet they graciously gave. How do we know this? Well, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to read to you the first few verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to let you know that the people that Paul is writing to, the church, uh, or writing about the churches of Macedonia, the Philippians are included in that. They were one of those churches in that region known as Macedon. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. Now, the background behind these verses is that Paul wanted the Corinthians, that's the church that he was writing to, to be generous and to take up a collection of money for the church at Jerusalem whose members were presently in deep financial trouble. You see, the Jewish believers of the Jerusalem church were faced with some serious economic problems. So Paul, being aware of the severe physical and financial needs facing the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, he was burdened to instruct predominantly Gentile churches like those in the region of Macedon in this church in the city of Corinth, to collect money for them. Now, a closer look at these Macedonian Christians reveals some very significant things about them. And Paul is presenting them as an example to the church at Corinth. Be like them. Be like them in generosity. First thing Paul does is speak about the grace of God, he says, which has been given in the churches of Macedon or Macedonia. Now, why does he mention the grace of God? And what does he mean by that? He's simply referring to the salvation of these Macedonian Christians because they were saved by grace. That's what he's talking about, their conversion. And his purpose in bringing up the grace of God in their lives is to point out that grace, salvation, conversion has radically affected them. It's impacted every area of their lives. They are changed. They're transformed. God's grace in salvation has transformed their character so that they had become generous with their money as demonstrated by their liberal giving to the poor Jewish Christians at Jerusalem. Truth is, by nature, no one is born generous. No one is born generous by nature. No one is born thoughtful of others. In Titus chapter 3, he actually says that in our unregenerate states, we are haters of one another. So no one's born generous, no one is born thoughtful, especially towards complete strangers. It takes the work of God, takes the grace of God in our lives to transform us from being self-absorbed, stingy tightwads who think only about spending money on ourselves into people who now share our money with others expecting nothing in return. Now that's what happens when you are converted See, the Bible teaches that one of the distinguishing marks of a true believer is that he shares his physical resources with others. That's part of the grace of God demonstrated in their lives. In fact, Ephesians 4 verse 28 says this, He who steals must steal no longer. If you were a thief before you were converted, stop it. Don't do it anymore. You put that off. That's old man behavior pre-salvation behavior, but rather, now that you're saved, Paul says, he must labor, performing with his own hands what's good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. He's to work hard, make enough money, take care of his own needs, the implication, of course, from other scriptures, take care of your family's needs, but give to others. He'll have something to share with one who has need. That's just part of the Christian life. And John tells us in 1 John 3, 17 and 18, whoever has the world's goods sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him. How does the love of God abide in him? The implication is it doesn't. And John adds, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. That is to say, don't just tell somebody you love them and say, I'll pray for you as you shiver in the cold and have nothing to eat. But do something about it. Now, why is generosity such a telling evidence of conversion? I mean, it's not the only evidence, but it is a significant one. Listen closely. Because when God saves us, he begins to conform us to the very character and nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And Christ, by nature, is absolutely generous and self-giving. The supreme statement in the Bible on the generosity of Christ is found in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Paul says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is his grace, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Paul is saying that although Jesus was rich in glory, in the sense that before his incarnation, he was in the form of God, and as such possessed all the glory, the power, the honor, the majesty of deity. He became poor by becoming a man. And while he never ceased to be God, he became the God-man, Jesus did give up all of those divine riches that he had while in the form of God. So that at salvation, we who are absolutely bankrupt, destitute spiritually, we become spiritually wealthy by possessing all of the unsearchable riches in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are to be generous with our money because Jesus has been generous with us. And he is in the process, this is progressive sanctification, of transforming our character to become like his, and that character is generous. Now I want you to notice something else about these Macedonian believers. Verse 2 of chapter 8. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. I find that these, these words are a bit awkward. A bit awkward. But essentially what Paul is saying is that the circumstances under which these people gave these Macedonian believers, these Philippians, it was very difficult. He called this time when they gave a great ordeal of affliction. At the time, they were afflicted. No doubt it's a reference to severe persecution at the hands of unbelievers. Secondly, in addition to suffering persecution, we read that these Christians were extremely poor. And that's what I want you to see. Paul mentions their deep poverty. Not just poverty, deep poverty. Which means that they were dirt poor. This specific Greek word that he uses here for deep means down to the depth. It means rock bottom. It means as low as it gets. You can't get any lower. And the specific word that the apostle uses for poverty describes the lowest form of poverty, of having nothing, of being completely destitute. So what Paul says, when Paul says that these Macedonian Christians were poor, he's acknowledging that they had hit rock bottom economically. And yet, in spite of being physically afflicted, in spite of being financially depleted, he says that they were generous in giving to the relief of the poor believers in Jerusalem. And watch this. They gave with great joy in their hearts. He says their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Simply put, folks, this means that in spite of having to scrape the bottom of the barrel, these poor Christians gave joyfully and they gave generously. Now, do you see why Paul used these churches from Macedonia as models of generous giving, it's because they totally disarm anyone who might feel like, well, I'm just too poor to be generous. They destroy all of the excuses we might come up with about holding on to our money because if their awful circumstances didn't hinder them from being generous, then how can any of us refuse to be generous to those who are in need? Now, Remember, it was to these Macedonian believers in the church at Philippi that Paul said that because they were so involved in giving to meet his needs, that God would supply their needs. Now, I take it that this is precisely what David is saying in Psalm 37, that in contrast to wicked unbelievers who can't pay back their debts because they have no money, they've lost their money, believers can rest in the faithfulness of God to meet our financial, material needs to the point where we will have enough, poor though we might be, we will have enough to be gracious in giving to others. Listen, there is no command here to be generous, no command by God to be generous. It's assumed that we'll be generous. 
But what David says about the generous, uh, about the believers, the righteous, he says they are gracious. They are givers. It certainly ought to cause us to evaluate our hearts by considering if we are generous towards others, there's always room for improvement in all of us. So are you compassionate in giving to the poor? That's something that you need to ask the Lord to help you on. Are you disciplined in giving? Do you have a heart to meet the financial needs of those who are hurting? There's always somebody who has less than us, no matter how poor you might be. David says that the righteous do this, but if generosity is not a part of your character at all, I mean, it's not even a struggle, then you do have to ask yourself, what's wrong? Is it possible that this lack of generosity is evidence of a far deeper problem, that perhaps you have never experienced God's grace, salvation in your life? Examine your heart. Now, those verses in Psalm 37 took a while to go through. But the other verses in this section won't take that long. So you can go, whew, okay. Because they all tend to feed off of David's teaching that God does give believers enough to be generous to others. So having told us that the first way that God blesses believers materially is that he blesses them with more than we need, David moves on to give us a second way that God blesses believers materially which is that he sustains them materially through all the ups and downs in life, the financial ups and downs. Verse 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Now, David says that the, the steps of a man, meaning by steps his ways, his movements, his actions, his behavior, they're established by the Lord. Now, note this, the kind of man that David is talking about isn't just any man, in general. No, but a man who is a believer. We know that because the very next phrase says that he, meaning the Lord, delights in his way. He delights in the way of a believer. And what David means by, by all of this is that a godly man's movements have all been sovereignly ordained by God himself. That's what he means when he says he establishes them. This word establish means to be safe, to be secure, because God sovereignly oversees it all, maintains this man's entire life. Nothing but the sovereignty of God in ordaining his steps. That's a wonderful truth. It's a wonderful, comforting truth to know that the ways of a believer are all under God's control. Concerning this, Charles Spurgeon said, all his course of life is graciously ordained, and in loving kindness, all is fixed, settled, and maintained. No reckless faith, no fickle chance rules us. Our every step is the subject of divine decree. What a great truth. You consider that God is even interested in us, but that he ordains all of our steps. And notice he delights in our movements. I love that. He delights in our movements as we press forward in pursuit of obeying him. Imagine the delight you have when you see your children, your grandchildren begin to walk and move and make progress. You delight in that. You take videos of that. God delights in his children and the movements that we make. What happens, though, when we run into trouble? What happens when we have problems, ups and downs, more downs than ups? Where, where is God then, the sovereign God? Does the Lord abandon us? Does he turn away from us? Well, David answers that question in verse 24. When he falls, this righteous man, this believer, he'll not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. David says that when this man, this believer in whom the Lord delights, when he falls, it will not be a fatal fall. He won't fall headlong as in a deadly crash because the Lord, David says, will sustain him. How? He'll hold his hand. Now, what, is, what does David mean by all this? Well, there's nothing in the context to indicate that the fall that David is referring to is a moral fall, a plunge into sin, but rather, he's talking about some type of financial fall. That's, that's the context. A calamity involving the loss of material wealth. And the point <coughs> that David is making is that when a believer runs into some kind of financial disaster, he can rest in the great truth 
that God is going to sustain him. David says the Lord will hold his hand. He'll bring him through this. It may look dark. It may look bleak. But he will bring him through this. Listen, no matter what you are going through right now in terms of your finances or what you will go through in the future, and only the Lord knows that, the Lord says, you have his word on it, that he will sustain you through all the financial ups and down that you will ever experience. Great truth, great comfort. Precisely the point that David was making earlier in the psalm, verses 3 through 9, when he talked about trusting in the Lord, committing your way to the Lord, which means to cast all of your burdens on him, resting in the Lord, being patient in the Lord. All that has to do with believing that God will take care of you materially. Even during those difficult times in life when you don't know how you are going to make it financially, he's got you by the hand. He's leading you through it. He's sovereign and he's good and he's wise. The Lord is always faithful to take care of his own. As the hymn writer so wondrously put it, great is thy faithfulness. Isn't that exactly what David was talking about when he wrote the famous Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The reason David had no wants is because he knew that he could count on God. God was his shepherd, and God would take care of him as one of the sheep. He'll provide for him. So he has no wants because God meets his his wants, his needs. And you can trust him too. And that's the point of this. You can trust him too. The Lord will never let you down. He'll never abandon you. He'll never let go of you. He's got you by the hand, no matter what your needs are. And to press home this point even further, David closes this section by telling us a third way that God blesses his people materially. He's already told us that he blesses his people by giving them more than they need. He's told us that he blesses his people by by sustaining them materially through the ups and downs of life. He now tells us that God never forsakes his people so that they fail to have enough material goods to live, to be sustained. Verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Now, based on what we read here, we know that David wrote this this psalm as an older man, advanced in age. We don't know how old, but he tells us that once he was young, now he's old. And in all of his many years, and there's been many from his youth to his old age, he has never once seen a believer forsaken by the Lord or any of the believer's children begging bread because God had abandoned them. In other words, he's saying that God will never stop providing for his own, for his own people, for his own children. As David looks back and he reflects on his many years, the many years that he has lived and known the Lord, he can't recall a single incident when God abandoned a believer, stopped providing for him and said, you're on your own, good luck. Now, it doesn't mean that God never lets people have financial difficulties. David's just told us about that. That there are ups and downs. Nor does it mean that believers never grow hungry because food supplies sometimes do get low. But the point that David is making is that a believer can always count on God to sustain him, to sustain others of his people by providing for the needs because he'll never abandon them to die of hunger. Listen, this is the very point that Jesus was making. In the Lord's Prayer, when he said, when you pray, pray, give us this day our daily bread. Sustain us, Lord, with what we need today. That's praying in the will of God. This is true not only in our country, where we're spoiled with more food than we need, but it's also true for believers in economically poor third world countries. He does that. This is why the Lord told his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount that they didn't need to worry about food and clothing. So said, isn't life more than that? Don't worry about that. Don't, don't be like the pagans. That's what they're obsessed with. But you, unlike the pagans, you have a loving heavenly father who cares for you. You're more important than birds. He'll take care of you. He'll provide for you. And I remind you, our Lord, just before going back to glory, said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. In fact, God sustains us so well that David concludes this section of the psalm just as he began it began this section by telling us that we will have more than enough to share with others. Verse 26, 
All day long, he's gracious and lends. He's talking about believers. And his descendants are a blessing. True believers, David writes, are a blessing to others by being gracious in loaning their, mother, their money to others. Now, according to the law of Moses, a Jewish person was not to charge interest in loaning their money. So there was no personal gain to be made at the expense of somebody's hardship. But the point that David is making here is that the reason this believer has the money in the first place to loan to somebody is because God doesn't forsake him. He sustains him. He sustains him with enough material goods for himself, his family, and for others who are in need. So how do we apply these truths to our lives? Well, for one thing, for one thing, we should stop worrying about money and start thanking the Lord that he has promised to supply our needs. These would be good verses to memorize, meditate on. You don't have to worry about money. Such an acceptable sin in our culture to worry about money, but Jesus said, don't worry about money. Stop being anxious about it. Secondly, we need to determine that we are going to be generous, pursue generosity, be disciplined to be generous, be thinking about it, and give some of our resources to others who have needs because that's what people who have been saved by grace do. They're supposed to be gracious by being generous. So, you and I ought to be looking for opportunities to be generous with others. Even if you don't have a great deal yourself, you always have enough to give to someone who's in need. And for those who are without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't know the Savior. He's a name to you. He's a word. He's a Bible character. But you don't know him personally. You need to see and ponder how gracious God is. Christ, who is fully God, became poor by becoming a man so that we might become spiritually rich in him. See, without Jesus Christ, you are spiritually, you may have a lot of money, but you are spiritually destitute. You are a bankrupt sinner. You have no righteousness to commend yourself before God. If you were to, be, if you were to die in that state, you would not go to heaven. Because God requires the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your record. And he requires that all, all your sin must be forgiven. And he will not forgive apart from faith in Christ. Christ died for sinners. When you trust him to be your savior and, and cast your eternal destiny upon him and his death on the cross, God forgives your sins and he takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ who perfectly obeyed the law and he places that on your account. That's when you become wealthy in Christ. Right now, you have nothing to commend yourself before God. So I urge you, turn to Christ before it's too late. Cast yourself upon him for his mercy and salvation. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you that you are faithful. You are a loving father who cares about us, Lord. Thank you for all the times that so many of us can look back and see that you were faithful. When we didn't know where money was coming from, when we wondered where we would have the money to pay our bills, to take care of what we considered to be necessities, you always have come through. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for showing us that you are kind and you are interested in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to not only praise you and trust you and not worry, but to be determined to be generous and thoughtful to others. For someday, this world will be over, and as John puts it, all the things in this world will be gone too. Help us. Help us while we're here to use our resources for your honor and your glory. Help us, Lord, when we go into restaurants to be mindful of those who wait upon us to be gracious, even if, even if the service is not the best, help us to be gracious and kind to them and to reflect Christ in our generosity. Lord, we do pray also for those without Christ. We pray that you'll open their hearts to the gospel. Lord, only you can do that. Only you can do that. We pray that they will see their need for Christ and turn to him and cast themselves upon you for salvation. All of this, Lord, 
We do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that you will be back tonight. We have a wonderful baptismal service. You'll be encouraged to hear the testimonies. Have a great day, and you're dismissed.